Okay. Uh, so we talked about basic chemistry. Now what our focus is going to be is more on the biological aspects of the chemical level of organization. And we're going to start by talking about water, which is probably the most important substance as far as allowing life to exist on our planet. So first, uh, and you already labeled a, a drawing similar to this from the previous lecture, so I'm just going to run through this very quickly. But remember, I told you there's four things you should be able to label on a, a test um, as far as the structure of water goes. First, you should be able to label the kind of bonds that are holding a water molecule together. So what kind of bonds are those? Within one. These are your polar covalent bonds. What about the dotted lines between the molecules? Right, those are your hydrogen bonds. Remember, hydrogen bonds, in reality, they're not really, we call them bonds, but they're just the strongest of the attractions between molecules, whereas a polar covalent bond is what's creating the actual molecule. The other thing that you should be able to label is the, are the partial charges. Remember, because the electrons tend to hang around the oxygen more, you can see it more in this drawing, these are all the electrons hanging around the oxygen. So what ends up happening, if you uh, may remember this from chemistry, and you do not have to know for this class bond angles or anything, but there's something called Vesper theory that basically says that electrons really don't like to be next to each other, and so they sort of push these bonds downward, and that's why water has this bent structure. So you have these electrons here hanging around the oxygen, and then you have these little hydrogens, which are way, way smaller, and, they, and there's not as much electron charge hanging around there. So you end up with these partial charges. It looks kind of like a like a uh, unclosed figure eight. And it's negative on the oxygen because that's where the electrons are hanging around. And then it's slightly positive on the two hydrogens. The hydrogen bonds, when they form, are always going to be between the hydrogen of one water and the oxygen of another because opposites attract. So the slight positive is going to be attracted to slight negatives. All right, so that's overall, that's the structure. I know we talked about it before, but that's sort of a rehash of the main things that you should know. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the properties. So because of its structure, it has some specific properties. The first one is that water is called the universal solvent. Technically, it's not universal. It doesn't dissolve everything. But it is such a good solvent, it dissolves almost everything. Um, it dissolves, basically anything that's polar will dissolve in water, so anything that has partial charges, and then every single ionic substance will dissolve in water. And ionic substances, you may remember, or maybe not, are also called salts. So salts, which are your ionic substances, they separate, when they, when they break up in water, they separate into ions, which if you recall from our previous um, lecture, are just charged particles. And these little charged particles are extremely important in living systems because they control a lot of things like um, transport, nerve impulses, uh, muscle contractions, just all kinds of things that are keeping you alive have to do with these ions, these charged particles that are floating around in the water. Keep in mind also, just a reminder, since we didn't talk about this vocabulary word in the previous lecture, but remember that a solvent is something that dissolves things or a dissolving medium, what do we call the thing that gets dissolved? Good, so the solute, solutes are the things that we're talking about that are dissolving in the solvent. Uh, this diagram here, just to show you, you don't have to uh, do anything with it, but just make it a little bigger. So this is just showing some examples of all the little charged ions. This is the cell membrane in the diagram, and they're just showing that you have little special proteins in the cell membrane that are carrying things through. So you have all kinds of ions floating in your body fluids and in your blood, and those ions are going to be really important, and your body controls which ones can pass in and out. The other diagram here is just showing how an ionic substance like salt, if I can make it bigger here again, an ionic substance like salt, uh, sodium chloride, and the water basically surrounds and breaks it up into those little ions, those little floating particles. It's called solvation. So the water molecules sort of surround and break up the salt. And this is true of all ionic substances. So this is called being the universal solvent. Now, anything that likes water is called hydrophilic, water-loving. What about if it doesn't like water? Right, good. Hydrophobic are the things that don't like water. 
And in, in living substances, probably the, the most obvious one is going to be fats and oils. Fats and oils are hydrophobic. They don't like water. There are other things, hexanes, gasoline, whatever. But hopefully you don't have gasoline floating around in your body. So as far as living things go, the natural substances that are repelled by water are usually the fats and oils. And they're actually organized by water. If you think about it, you shake up like uh, water and oil, you can make it mix like for a, a minute or so. And then the oil like globs together. It's almost like the water pushes it away. And that's called hydrophobic exclusion. When things that water does not like basically get pushed away and actually glob together. It makes it easier to get the oil out of the water. It's certainly easier to pull something hydrophobic out of water than something that dissolves in the water. It would be much harder to remove dissolved salt from water. You have to evaporate the water or something. Whereas removing oil is pretty easy. It's going to separate and it's all going to glob together and then you can get it out. So any, sub, any questions about water being the universal solvent? All right, so it dissolves most things, and that's why it gets that name, universal solvent. There are things that don't dissolve in water, and again, those things are called hydrophobic. The most common one you would think of would be fats and oils as far as living things go. There are other things, wax and, and stuff like that. Okay, the second thing that, or property that water has is that water is sticky. The scientific terminology would not be sticky. Uh, but the properties of being cohesive and adhesive. So cohesive refers to the fact that water molecules stick to each other, that water sticks to itself. It'll actually bead up. If you think about water on, uh, on your car after it rains, it beads up into these little balls. That's being cohesive. Water is also adhesive. It tends to stick to surfaces. You're going to look at both of these properties in the lab. If you've ever been to the doctor and they prick your finger because they want to check your like red blood cell count, or if you donate blood, they'll do it too. And they put this little capillary tube up to the drop of blood, and the blood like magically sucks right up that capillary tube. That's called capillary action. That's actually a large part of why water travels up plants. If you really think about it, water shouldn't travel up plants. I mean, everything else falls to the ground. If I drop it, gravity takes it down. So why would water go up to the top of a redwood tree when gravity should prevent water from traveling in that direction? And a large portion of the reason is because of capillary action. Inside of plants, you have little capillary-like tubes called xylem. I don't know if you remember learning about plants before. But they're basically little, little tubes, very much like the same capillary tube that um, you're going to use one in the lab to, to look at this. And what's going to happen is as water starts to come in at the roots, it starts to travel up. Water's also evaporating away at the leaves. So it's almost like you sucking through a straw. You've got this pull from the leaves, and then you've got this little skinny tube in the plant. And the water is adhesive, so it sticks to the inside of the tube. And at the same time, it's cohesive. So as one water molecule starts to get pulled up, it brings a bunch of friends with it. And this is why water would travel up a plant. Even without the evaporation of the leaves, water would still start to travel up just because of the little tiny tubes. And you'll see this in the lab. We're going to have capillary tubes. You're going to put them in water. You'll literally see the water will just go right up the tube. Another property that comes about from water sticking to itself is the property of surface tension. So surface tension is what it sounds like. It's where the surface of the water, all those molecules, sort of stick together. Why is this important? Because this will allow a living thing to actually walk on the water. If you think about um, small organisms like little water striders and things, they can actually walk on the surface. It also prevents water molecules from escaping. This is one of the reasons water doesn't evaporate super easily is because the, the water molecules, if you imagine these little hydrogen bonds sort of temporarily forming, it's almost like all the little water molecules are holding hands and they can't escape. One of the things you're going to do in the lab tomorrow is you're going to try to float a paper clip in water. Technically, if you put a paper clip into a beaker of water, it should sink. I mean, the, the metal is more dense than the water. It will sink. But if you're really careful and you lay it on there, you can make the paper clip float. Just because of that sort of invisible film on the surface of the water, the surface tension, that sort of resists being broken. You can also feel this if you've ever done a belly flop. When you hit the water, that surface tension resists being broken for a split second, right? You do break through, but it hurts. And if you were to fall from high enough, water will kill you just like hitting a sidewalk. It's not like if you fall off a 10-story building and you land in a pool of water, you'll be safe. You may still die or have broken bones uh, because the surface tension resists, that invisible film resists being broken for a split second. If you slap water, you'll feel this, right? Your hand 
you can even shoot a gun underwater and the bullet will slow down and it, it won't even hurt the person that you shoot at because water will slow it down that much. The surface tension um, will break that and then, uh, and then it'll travel much more slowly. So that's, um, those are all properties that have to do with water sticky, being sticky. All right, next one. Water is a good temperature moderator, meaning basically that the temperature of the water doesn't like to change. The scientific terminology for this is that it has a high specific heat. So one of the things you're going to do in the lab is you're going to look at, at the specific heat of water. So specific heat in chemistry is a measurement of how much energy it takes to raise the water's temperature. Uh, a lot of times it'll be measured in, for example, joules. You don't have to write this down, but like joules per gram. It's like how many joules. We usually think of calories in, instead of joules, but think of sort of like calories. How much energy can a water molecule absorb without getting any hotter? A very obvious example of this is when you put a pot of water on the stove. If I just put an empty pot on the stove and turn on the stove and wait 30 seconds and put my hand in that pot, the metal will burn me because metal has a really low specific heat. So the metal's temperature, as soon as I add heat to that metal, it absorbs the heat, it changes temperature, and it gets hot really fast. But if I put some water in that pot, I could probably leave it there five minutes and still put my hand in the water and it's barely warmed up at all. It takes a long time to force the water to boil. Why? Because it can absorb a lot of energy without actually getting hotter. So this is called having a high specific heat. Why is this important? Because that means that your body is not going to get hotter very quickly. It means that organisms that live in a watery environment, even if it gets really cold. I went to Colorado a few years ago in June. In the daytime, it was in the 80s. At night, it was still dropping down to the 50s. So things that live in the forest are going to have to deal with a temperature change of 30 degrees over just a few hours. Things that live in the water don't have to worry about that. If you've ever gone in your pool in the spring, you're like, okay, it's hot outside. I can go in my pool again. You jump in the pool, it's still cold. Because it takes a long time to heat that water up. So it's probably not until the middle of the summer when it's hot all day and stays fairly hot at night that the water actually gets hotter. So this protects living things from temperature changes. Oops. Um, it also holds on to heat and cools very slowly. So vice versa. You're going to do this in the lab. You're going to have a beaker of water, a beaker of alcohol, which is not as polar as water and has a much lower specific heat. You're going to put both of them on ice, and you're going to measure how quickly the temperature drops. And you will see a difference because it takes a lot. You have to remove a lot of energy to cool the water down. Water really maintains a stable temperature. And again, the, the reason why this would be important for us is that it would protect living things from temperature changes. It would protect you within your body, the water in your body not changing, and you're like 70% water. And the water organisms that live in water, the water around them would protect them from temperature changes. So they wouldn't have to worry about the temperature changing very quickly. All right, going along these same lines, there's something called heat of vaporization. This is another chemistry term. Basically, heat of vaporization is a measurement of how much energy it takes to convert water to vapor. In other words, how, how much energy does it take to change water from liquid water into water as, as steam or as gas? And the way that sweat cools your body is based on the high heat of vaporization of water. It's not the actual sweating that cools you. You could sweat all day, just secrete sweat onto your skin, and you would not cool down at all. But when sweat evaporates, it uses your body heat as the energy to evaporate it. So it basically, it's called evaporative cooling. It literally takes heat away as it evaporates into the air. It uses your body heat as the, as the energy to convert it from liquid to, to uh, gas. You might remember a, a thing that looked like this. And this was like, this is liquid here, and this is gas, and this was the change. I don't know if you remember this in chemistry. And during that change, the temperature didn't change, but the energy was going into converting the water from liquid to gas to breaking the attractions. And that's what we're talking about. When sweat evaporates, it's using your body heat to break those attractions, and it cools you down. Same thing for turning water into ice. You have to remove a lot of energy to force water to turn into ice. So basically, water likes to be a liquid. Its temperature changes slowly. It takes a lot of energy to heat it and make it change into, into a gas, you have to remove a lot of energy to turn it into a solid. And that's just the diagram. Again, evaporate, it's the evaporation of the sweat that cools you down. 